What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the Fight Dialogue. My name is Tim. I am joined always as my as by my good friend Aldrick Warner. This is episode 34 of the Fight Dialogue. And our last episode we did on New Year's Eve. And that was right before the PFL Champions event that Aldrick was able to go to in New York City at the Madison Square Garden is like a little theater that they have there, kind of off to the side. It's not the main Madison Square Garden, right? Yeah, the Hulu Theater. The Hulu Theater. How'd that go, man? How was your New Year's Eve? Oh, it was pretty good. It was definitely a packed house for sure. Um, a lot of great, saw some entertaining fights. Um, a lot of celebrities are in the building. Mike Tyson was there presenting the belts. Um, Kamaru Usman, Henry Cejudo. All were in the building attendees, uh, Todd Duffy, JoJo Calderwood. It was a great event overall. Um, definitely kudos to the fight of the night uh, with Natan Schultz and Lloyd Rosvedov. That was definitely a great enjoyed it. Yeah, those guys killed each other. Like, there wasn't a lot of defensive movement in that fight. Uh, they pretty much just stood each in front of each other and went at it. It was a really great fight. And if you haven't seen the highlights for it, make sure you check it on our YouTube channel. We got the the full highlights for that fight. That was definitely the the highlight of the night. Emiliano Sordi, man, what a legend. Finished everybody, everybody he fought this season in the playoffs and in the finals. And he's the new champ, light lightweight champ, or light heavyweight, rather. Yeah, he definitely, um, you know, come from being like a regular contender from last season, came, coming up short, and then just had a redemption season, bouncing back and just killing the game. And he pretty much went undefeated this year in the whole entire uh, PFL tournament concept. Yeah, yeah. And he's a great contender out of Argentina. If I'm not mistaken, the only other um, big name guy out of Argentina is Ponza Nibio, right? And he fights for the UFC. And, uh, yeah, it, was he on the Tuesday night contender series, Emiliano Sordi? I saw a picture of him online and it looked like he was in that like little, um, that little place that they do all those contender series, uh, fights. I, I might be mistaken. I don't know. I can't remember, but I know he was in, um, yeah, I know he was in the last season of the PFL, but I don't know what he did before that, but if I was, uh, you know, the UFC or Bellator, I'd be looking to pick him up. I don't know what the status of their contracts are after the PFL seasons. I don't know if they're like free agents after each season or or how it works. I don't know if the signings are season by season or if it's like multiple seasons. Because, um, you know, we've seen some guys return, Natan Schultz return and obviously won again. Uh, Lance Palmer uh, returned again, won again. But some people we have not seen return, like Jake Shields and the like. So um, we'll see. We'll see what happens with Sordi and, and all these guys. We know that Rory's going to be uh, coming in next season. That should be exciting. Uh, he's definitely going to be the favorite to win the welterweight title. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, should be fun. PFL pumping out great fights. Well, there we'll w- actually, uh, sorry to cut you off. You're good. Conference. Ray Seffo confirmed that they're revamping the whole roster, so a lot of people won't be returning, but all the champions mm. who won will be returned. Um, probably maybe one or two contenders, like semifinalists, will, but they're talking about revamping the whole roster, so they're bringing some fresh faces. Badass. And uh, They've always had good scouts. They, they've they had a um, uh, good eye for talent in the PFL, the PFL, which was formerly the WSOF uh, World Series of Fighting. We all know Justin Gaethje came out of there. A lot of great fighters have fought under the um, the Ray Cepho banner, if you will. And I'm excited to see who else they bring in. So that was the PFL. Um, talk a little bit about Bellator. We were going to try to get ourselves into the... Uh, Cyborg versus um, uh, Julian uh, Juliana Julian Bud Julia Bud Julia Bud, and that fights all the way out in California. I think we got denied for that one, but uh, we're trying to get into this one on uh, in Connecticut, and that's the Pitbull versus Ferreira fight. Uh, Pitbull's going to be defending his title, and we got into the last Connecticut card, so I'm hopeful for this one. Uh, Aldrich's putting in the work and sending out the uh, 
sending out the creds, sending out the info to get the creds. So hopefully we will be able to go and do that in March. And, you know, we got into the PFL first uh, and covered their events. Uh, we've covered one Bellator event so far, and hopefully we can continue to cover their events. And we'll just keep moving on from there, moving on to bigger and better things each time. So I'm, exci- I'm excited for 2020, man. Can't wait. All right. It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. Um, so, obviously, we've got a big card coming up this Saturday, January the 18th. It's going to be UFC 246, Cowboy versus Connor. And the return of Connor, needless to say, is a big deal. And I've been trying to convince people that this card is worthwhile. I think it's worthwhile. I'm pretty stoked for it. Um, maybe it's because of the fact that it's been a full 18 days since I've seen like an MMA card, and I'm just <laughs> I'm just dying to watch some fights at this point. But I, I'm pretty excited for it. I'm pretty excited for the whole card. Um, my buddy Eric said, you know, it's pretty much a glorified fight night card, which I'm not going to argue that, but some of the best cards I've ever watched were fight night cards. I don't know about you. Like half half the epic fights that come to my mind when I think of like, um, you know, some of the best fights I've ever seen, they've been on fight night cards, you know, so I'm not going to I'm not going to diss a fight night card. Yeah, it's not the biggest names in the world that you're going to see, but that doesn't mean they can't fight or put on exciting fights. You know, so we're going to, uh, as promised in my last video, uh, I'm going to, me and Aldrich are going to break down this whole entire card, give you our full predictions and how we think the fight is going to go, which is something if you are used to this channel by now, you should be uh, familiar with. So let me look up this card on my phone real quick so I don't mess up anybody's names because I'm horrible with names. <laughs> uh, UFC.com. <clears throat> and we're on to the event. And as always, we will start from the bottom up, the early prelims, and give you our thoughts on each and every one of these fights. Early prelims are there. Okay. Okay, and we'll be 100% honest with you as well. Sabina Mazo versus J.J. Aldridge. Uh, J.J. Aldridge, I've seen fight before. She's a pretty well-rounded fighter. Sabina Mazo, though, I have no idea who she is. Have you heard of her? No, I've heard of J.J. Aldridge. I saw her in a fight. I try to remember. I think it was against Macy Barber, but she lost. But um, mm. I never heard of this other girl, so I'm going to rock with J.J. Aldridge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a safe bet. I don't know. This girl looks pretty tall, tall and lanky. We'll see how it goes. I don't know if she's a striker or a grappler, but that uh, length is going to... It's going to give her some advantages there. All right, we got Brian Kelleher versus Odie Osborne. Um, I've never seen Odie Osborne before, but I've seen Brian Kelleher before. He's another well-rounded guy. Um, but I think he lost his last fight. So I don't know who to go with on that Bantamweight fight. Um, let's go with Brian Kelleher because he's the familiar. All right, the return of Tim Elliott versus Askar Askarov. Um Tim Elliott is ranked 7th in the flyweight division, and Askarov is apparently ranked 12, even though I've never really heard of him. Uh, maybe I've seen him before. I mean, I had to have if he's ranked, right? Yeah. But we all know Tim Elliott. He's a very unorthodox fighter. He's got good wrestling, good um, good submission defense, except when he fought uh, 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 Joseph Benavidez. Sorry. Benavidez, I think, got him in a guillotine. But yeah, he's got real unorthodox techniques, and that's really hard for these people to handle. I've seen him throw cartwheel kicks and all types of crazy stuff. So yeah, I'm going to pick Tim Elliott, especially since he's so much higher ranked than Askarov. But um, eh, I don't know. I've never heard of that one guy. So what do you think? Uh, I'll go with Tim Elliott, too. Like Some of his names i never heard of. Mm -hmm. You know, flyweight division hasn't really got a lot of spotlight um, since, you know, Mighty Mouse left. So, I mean, I'm definitely going to go with Tim Elliott to save bet. Mm. Now, the next one is a light heavyweight bout between 
Alexa Kammer, and Justin Ledette. Justin Ledette, I don't know why he still fights in the UFC. He has been starched a couple times, and his last fight, I think, was against Johnny Walker, and Johnny Walker pretty much finished him in a couple seconds. Uh, Alexa Kammer, I think he was on the Tuesday Night Contender Series, and he obviously did well if he made it to the UFC. So I'm going to go with uh, the newcomer and camera because Justin Ledet, he's not very well-rounded. I, I've never seen him do anything on the ground. He's got good hands, but that's pretty much it. And that's a pretty one-dimensional fighter, if you ask me. So hey. let's, go, let's go with the new blood. Prelims. All right. Now, there's actually some pretty good... Um, Pretty good fights on this prelim card here. We got Chaz Skelly versus Grant Dawson. Grant Dawson, he was on the Tuesday Night Contender Series, and he won his debut, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Chaz Skelly is a good fighter, good grappler, uh, and he's got power, too. I think he has a, pr a couple pretty good submissions on his record. Um I don't know too much about Grant Dawson's fighting style, but he is, you know what? Let me look into him a little bit here. These are featherweights, by the way. It's giving me like takedown stats and shit. Oh, apparently he's won 71% of his fights by submission. So this could be a good grappling match between these guys. Like I said, Chaz Skelly, he's, He's got some uh, got some good subs on his record. Yeah. Don't know who's going to win. Uh, Chaz Skelly is a veteran. He's been in the octagon longer than Dawson, so I'm going to have to go with Skelly. What about you? Uh, I'll go with um, – see here. I'll go with Skelly as well. This is going to be an interesting, uh, like you said, grappling match. Uh, a lot of these guys are like – I've seen Chaz Skelly uh, fight before, but I've, um, the other guy you said on the – he was Grant Dawson. He does look familiar. I think I did see him on the Tuesday Night Contender Series. Yeah. Yeah, and he's like a recent guy, too. Like, I think he just got into the UFC. I'm pretty sure he's had at least one fight in the promotion so far. But uh, speaking of, like, up-and-coming guys, we've got Nazrat Hakparast. I hope I said his name right, versus Drew Dober. Both um, veterans, but both still kind of new. Uh, I think... Drew Dober's had more fights with the promotion. And, you know, he's had his wins. He's had his losses. He's a good Muay Thai guy. And he's pretty um, pretty savvy on the ground, too. He's hard to submit. Very, very strong. Nazrat is... He's from Germany. Never would have guessed it. But excellent striker. Very dynamic. Uh, I don't really know what he can do on the ground. I don't think I've ever really seen him on the ground. But we've seen him beat the crap out of some people uh, so far in his career. And he is the Kelvin Gastelum lookalike, by the way. He so uh, let's just call him Kelvin 2.0. And yeah, yeah, that should be a good test for him against Drew Dober. Oh, man, Drew Dober's legs are huge. That guy, that guy, I bet, hits hard. Oh, let's go with Nazrat. I think he's got a little bit of hype behind him. Let's jump on the hype train. Well, I will at least. <laughs> Definitely. I've seen him fight before. I know he trains out there for Azahabi and GSP, so um, I know he comes from a great uh, camp. Uh, I've seen him in a lot. I don't remember what fight was it, but he did start the guy pretty damn good. So, Yeah, he's building a highlight reel for himself, but... As I mentioned, Drew Dober's definitely going to be his toughest test yet because um, Dober's a scrappy veteran. Uh, come on, cooperate with me, website. Okay, next, we got Andre Feely versus Sadiq Yusuf. I am actually pretty damn excited for this one. Andre Feely, he's a bit of a gatekeeper, or not even a gatekeeper. I, I mean, to be a gatekeeper, you got to be ranked, right? It says he's not even ranked. I'm pretty sure he's a featherweight. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, featherweight. Because Yusuf is freaking huge, man. If he's a bantamweight, there's a problem. Yeah, it's got to be featherweight. But anyway, Mr. Touchy Feely, he's a, he's a good veteran. You know, he's had his ups and downs in his UFC career so far. But I think he's on a good 
win streak right now over he's had a couple wins he's won over cub swanson recently is that his most recent fight um i think so god damn it now i'm gonna have to actually click on his profile <laughs> uh he just beat this kid marais uh ah uh, fuck marais oh uh he beat miles jury a decision over Miles Jury. I remember watching that fight. It wasn't too exciting, but it's still a good name to have um, under your belt there. He lost to Michael Johnson. Yeah, I mean, he fights good guys. Andre Feely is a good fighter. Oh, man, he beat the GOAT, Artem Loboff. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> he fought Calvin Qatar. Qatar beat him. Uh, looks like decision. So he fights good guys. And when he loses, it's not usually um, like a finish loss or something. I mean, I remember he got finished once. I forget who the hell knocked him out. But yeah, he's a well-rounded fighter. He's got a he's good striker. He trains with Team Alpha Male. He's a good wrestler. But uh, Sadiq Yusuf, uh, I think he's the Nigerian guy. He's got sick power, dude. Does. Um, he starts his last last opponent. He might have starts his last couple opponents. I mean, he did get rocked early in his last fight. He also on UFC 243. I uh, forgot who his opponent was, but he did get stunned a couple of times. So, I mean... Benitez, honestly, the Mexican guy. Yeah. Yeah, I remember watching that. I mean, Benitez connected, and then I think he... Uh, Sadiq knocked him out, like, right after... He got yeah. rocked. Like he got rocked, then he recovered, and then he knocked Benitez out. Uh, he also has a win over Marais. Uh Mokhtarian. Yep, that was a first round knockout. Was he on the Tuesday night contender series as well? Yes, he was. Okay. Got a lot of guys coming out of there now. So yeah, I whew, this might be a good fight. I'm gonna have to go with Yusuf. He um I think he's going to get the knockout, honestly. Fight of the night. I'm calling it right now. Yeah, I could see it. Um, okay, so moving on. Roxanne Mataferi versus Macy Barber. Macy Barber has not lost, if I'm not mistaken. No, she has is not. not lost in the UFC, and she's on a tear. This is women's flyweight. She's ranked number nine. Mataferi's actually ranked higher, ranked number seven. Mataferi... She's she's been in the game a while. Her record is 23 15 and oh, I didn't realize she had that many losses on her record. I mean, I know she's not like a world beater, but I didn't know she had that many losses. But she's fought some good people, Mata Ferry. Um, she's definitely a good grappler, she's got good technical jujitsu. Um, not much of a striking game though, if I'm not mistaken. She beat Shevchenko. Uh, uh, what's her face's sister? Oh, Valentina's sister. Yes, she beat Valentina's sister, and that was by decision. But it was a pretty, uh, I would say it was dominant enough, you know. Mm -hmm. That's right, Eubanks beat her, and her most recent win is over Maya something Maya. I remember that fight though, yeah. So, I mean, it's on two fight winning streak, but. Let's see here. Now, go back. Jesus. Um, yeah, Macy Barber. She, her nickname is The Future, and I think that is going to be it. She's 7-0, and man. And she's beat some tough chicks. I'm going to call Macy Barber on that one. She might win by knockout even. Oh, yeah. Macy Barber has definitely been on a, a tear. I know she came off the Tuesday Night Contender Series, too. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, she's basically she's one of the young guns in the game. She's trying to beat John Jones's record for youngest champion. So she's climbed the ladder. Yeah, she's young. Yes. And um yeah. she trains in their great camp. Um she trains at Factory X and then she trains with Duke Rufus too. And you know, she's actually been mentored by Anthony Pettis, who's also on this card for the whole entire uh thing. So I can see her definitely winning this fight. Um, I've seen Roxanne train when I was out in Vegas at Syndicate. Um, like I said, she's very a great technical grappler. Um, she probably might give Macy Barber an actual test. I won't count her out totally. If it goes to the ground, I can see a test. If it's standing up, Barber definitely got it by advantage. Yeah, Macy Barber should definitely keep it standing because if she 
goes to the ground, she's actually giving Roxanne a bit of a chance. But otherwise, I think Macy Barber's going to run right through her. She got a big head. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just had to throw that out there. All right, next, Anthony Pettis versus Diego Ferreira. I don't know why this is the first fight on the um, on the main card. This should be why. this should be like the not the co-main event, but like the co-co-main event. This should be the third fight up, honestly. But maybe it's because of Ferreira, because Ferreira is not as well known. But Anthony Pettis, man, come on! Exactly. I mean. Uh, his last fight against Nate Diaz was very respectable. I mean, it was a great fight, and he gave Nate Diaz a test, you know. Uh, Diego Ferreira, he's looked good lately. He's looked very good. His last fight against Tysimov, as I mentioned in the last video, was epic. Tysimov's a tough dude. He won all three rounds with him. Um, he had his, I'm pretty sure he lost the entire first round of that fight, like pretty badly. And then came back in the second and third and took it to Tyson off. He's a tough guy. He's a tough guy. He's well-rounded. He's got submissions. He's got striking. Anthony Pettis is definitely going to have the striking advantage in this fight. Um, the jujitsu might be a little even though, but I'm still going to have to give it to Anthony Pettis. This is a lightweight fight. This is Anthony Pettis' natural weight. You know, it's not going to be at 170. Um, not that Anthony Pettis does poorly at 170, but this, I think, is the best weight for Anthony Pettis. I have Anthony Pettis with, like, uh, let's say, second-round knockout. Uh, I see him winning by, uh, i say his famous guillotine. Guillotine. Yeah, he's got good chokes, man. He's dangerous. He, I mean, people forget this is a guy that choked out Charles Oliveira. I mean, Charles Oliveira has the record in the UFC for the most submissions. Yes, he does. More than Hoist Gracie, more than anybody else, Charles Oliveira has the most. And Anthony Pettis submitted him. So that goes without saying. Anthony Pettis has some amazing jujitsu. I mean, at least uh, like for MMA, you know, jujitsu that's adapted for MMA. So the next fight, we have Alexa Grasso versus Claudia Gadelia. Uh, Claudia, she's fought the best of the best in the division, without a doubt. She fought Joanna twice. The second time, she came very close to winning. If she didn't gas out, she might have been champion. Yeah. But um, ever since that fight, she hasn't looked the same. She hasn't she, at all. I mean, she's gotten wins since then, but they've been they've been hard fought, and her losses, she's looked, you know, a little. I don't, I don't know. A lackluster, I guess. I don't know. She, I think her problem is she's trying to strike too much. She's trying to be a striker. She's not a striker. She's a grappler. She gets people to the ground. She grinds them out from the top. She's a very, very strong and athletic girl. But these striking battles that she's letting herself get goaded into, um, She's not doing herself any favors by keeping the fight standing. Um, I think she needs to get this fight to the ground. Alexa Grasso is very well-rounded, very young, um, but she's fought some some good competition. Um, Alexa Grasso has. Let me let me click on her profile because I. She's she's very pretty too. Very pretty. She's fought Carlos uh, Carla Esparza, and honestly, I think Grasso won that fight against Esparza. Esparza did very well and I think I think Esparza won the first two rounds. Yeah, she, yeah, she, she won her. like the Yeah, she she was like wrestling her in the in the beginning of the fight. I forget exactly how I scored it, but I, Grasso started to come back, I think. And yeah, it was a good fight and she beat uh Kowalowicz. Uh Karol Karolina, is that her yeah. first name? Karolina. Yeah, Kowalowicz, the Polish woman. Uh, that fought for the title a couple times. She beat her. Um, she fought Tatiana Suarez, lost to her, but no shame there. You know, so she's fought some stiff competition. You know, um, she's. I mean, she's really fought the best of the division. She fought Felice Herring, or Herrig, rather, and that was a decision. Not as experienced as Claudia, but still experienced enough to certainly. Um, you know, be in the ring with her. 
Um, I'm going to go with Grasso on this fight because Claudia just has not impressed me. She's she's fought to her opponent's strengths in her last couple fights, and he, you don't want to do that. Uh, so I'm going with Grasso. Um, definitely a great matchup. Like you said, Claudia hasn't looked the best. Um, I know that she does train in Nick Catones. She does train under Mark Henry, so of course she has sharpened her tools as far as her striking. Uh, Mark Henry is a very underrated striking coach, in my opinion. Doesn't get enough respect. Um, but I'm going to have to go with Grasso as well, too, just because she's one of the new upcomers. This new wave is coming in. I won't say she has a hype train behind her because I think she's not fully respected. And like you said, she has fought tough opponents. And um, I think she's definitely going to look for a bounce back with a comeback win against a very um, top, higher top 10 opponent because uh, she is making her way up that straw weight ladder. We know the straw weights is uh, very stacked right now. You know, you got monsters. Like Wele Zhang, Rose Nami Yunus is making her come back too. Uh, Johanna, who's getting ready to fight for the title. So the strawweight division the women, in the women's uh, platform, MMA, is definitely climbing. And she's definitely on the surge. So I can see her winning this fight. Actually, I probably got her winning by TKO second round. Damn. Yeah, I mean, if that happens, that will definitely put her in title contention talk. She's ranked number 11 right now, but Claudia's ranked number 6. So if she can get a finish against Claudia, that will um, be huge for her. And speaking of Rose Namajunas, I think they announced a rematch between her and uh, Andrade. Yeah. And that is going to be interesting. That's going to be very interesting. It because as we, as we all know, Rose Namajunas lost her title to Andrade. But if you watch the fight, Rose was beating the crap out of her. Hard um, to our striking was crisp. <laughs> it was crisp. And she and clearly, clearly Rose was the more skilled fighter that night, but perhaps not the most uh, prepared or the smartest. Um, she kept uh, she kept fishing for that Kimura. I mean, yes, the Kimura was there, but it also wasn't there because yeah. If the person is threatening to slam you, you gotta let it go. And that the t the when she got slammed, that was the second time Andrade went to go slam her. The first time she hoisted her up in the air, Rose let go, and they continued to fight. The second time, you gotta learn your lesson. And Andrade took advantage of Rose's stubbornness and won the title that night. So I will be interested to see this rematch to see if Rose has learned her lesson about, you know, uh, poking the bear because uh, that's what Andrade is. She's a freaking bear in that division. Um, Alexi Olenek versus Maurice Green. Maurice Green was on the Ultimate Fighter and he's got sick power. But other than that, I don't really think he has anything special to offer the heavyweight division. You know, he just not really impressed me with any kind of grappling or kicking ability, anything like that. Alexi Olenek, a veteran of many, 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 many fights, oh, well over 60 fights. Uh, he has the most Ezekiel chokes ever in the history of anything ever. <laughs> yeah. And he gets them from the craziest spots. I can easily see him getting another Ezekiel choke against Maurice Green uh, on Saturday night. What do you think? Oh, I definitely agree. And in my opinion, this fight should have kicked off the card and not Anthony Pettis and Diego Ferreira. But, you know. Yeah, yeah, I agree. This should have been, I mean, maybe, I mean, maybe uh, the website is just fucked up. It wouldn't surprise me. Because uh, <laughs> I've gone on this website before and there's like, a picture of a chick and then it'll say like Connor McGregor <laughs> like the website is screwed up sometimes it just sometimes it's doesn't make sense maybe they're they are um flipped and maybe Anthony Pettis is in the the Coco main event spot I don't know I don't trust it I don't trust technology but I, but, I, I gotta let yeah. me get this one too I mean Maurice Green like you say he's still fairly new I mean, unless he get like a quick knockout, then that's cool. But when it gets this to the ground, you it's over. It's pretty much over. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, or not even like uh, Alexi Olenek just has to grab him. He's got to hug him and then just pull guard, and he can get the Ezekiel from there. So, yep. So, Holly Holm, Raquel Pennington. This should be interesting. Their first fight, this is a rematch, by the way. I think um, this was the first person Holly Holm fought in the UFC, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, this was her first. That was her UFC debut, and she won by decision, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and I remember people saying, myself included, like, Wow, Holly Holm has so much hype behind her. You know, she's like this championship boxer, this and that. She had all these knockouts and legacy. And um, she came in and she fought Raquel, who was pretty, uh, like, not an unknown, but not not very well respected back then because she was just coming off the Ultimate Fighter. I don't think she won the Ultimate Fighter that season. I might be mistaken on that, but... Um, and yeah, it went to a decision and it wasn't like the most exciting fight either. Oops. And yeah, people were, myself included, were saying like, wow, like, uh, you know, Holly Holm must not be that good or whatever. But this was before we understood what a great fighter Raquel Pennington was. Yeah. Um, I mentioned it before. She's a girl that's gone the distance with Amanda Nunes with ch in a title fight. Five rounds, which is not something everybody can say. I mean, granted, you can argue that the fight should have been stopped sooner in that uh, Amanda Nunes fight. But yeah, she got her nose broken, if I'm not correct. Yeah, yeah. She was bleeding pretty bad. But the point is Raquel is tough as shit. And Holly Holm is a legend at this point uh, with all her wins on her record. So this, I think, will be... A much more interesting fight this time. Uh, we're not talking about a newcomer and an unknown here. We're talking about a tough as nails title contender and a legendary former champ. Yeah, it should be awesome. Definitely. So, that's the co-main event. So now, at long last, Conor McGregor versus Donald Cerrone. Uh, people have been asking me about this, you know, the filthy casuals that I work with asking me, oh, who's going to win, Conor McGregor, blah, blah, blah. Listen, I do like Conor as a fighter. Um, I'm not exactly in agreement with all his extracurricular activities and all the bullshit that surrounds him. Yeah. Everybody loves Donald Cerrone, myself included. Me too. In terms of how their fight is going to go, um, let's consider all the variables here. Connor's been out of the octagon since what? Like the middle of 2018? Yeah. Right? So it's been over a year since he's fought. Um, and meanwhile, he's had all this stuff going on outside the octagon. Cerrone is definitely the more active fighter. He's had, a, he's had a ton of fights since then. Cerrone's older. Probably, t like, he's over the hump. You know, maybe he's not close to retiring. Maybe he is. But he's definitely not in his prime anymore, mm -hmm. I would say. Connor, Who knows? I don't know if he's in his prime uh, maybe he still is. Uh, he's still like at that age where he's he could potentially be in his prime, but he hasn't been active enough, so it's hard to say. Um, in terms of skills, I would say Cerrone's more well-rounded. He has more tools in his arsenal. He has great Muay Thai, great kicks. Um, he has... Uh, surprisingly good wrestling. It's not the best part of his game, but he has it. He has the ability to take people down. Very underrated, his, in my opinion. Yes, and his his grappling overall is superb, especially when accompanied with his striking. He will hurt you on the feet, get you to the ground, submit you. That's usually how he submits people. But as we saw with Mike Perry, he has the ability to attack off of his back, even if you're not hurt. So, Connor would be a fool to take him down or to allow Cerrone to take him down. But Connor definitely has 
a striking advantage in this fight. I mean, and that's saying something because Cerrone is a really excellent striker. I would say Connor's striking is slightly more dynamic. He has a, a couple of flashy moves that he uses to kind of um, uh, to kind of bait you into attacking him, and then he comes in with a nice crisp counter. He's a sniper. He's got an excellent counter left, um, and he's willing to take a shot to give a shot, as is Cerrone. But um, I think that Connor has a little bit more punishing power, and the question is, will he carry that power at 170? We saw him against Nate Diaz at 170, and Nate Diaz has an incredible chin, and he dropped Nate Diaz like two or three times in their rematch and beat him up pretty bad in the first round of their original fight. So it's not like we've never seen Connor at 170 before. It's just that we've only seen him fight one guy at 170. Yeah. And this is a different, uh, I'm sorry, a different 170 Connor because the 170 Connor that we've seen before was basically a 155 Connor that didn't cut weight. You, you understand what I'm trying to say? He was kind of just a little heavier. That's all he was. He was. This Connor is actually, I mean, from pictures, I, I mean, you can only guess so much, but from what it looks like to me is he packed on some muscle for this fight. So he's more of a true 170 or um, he's at least filled out a little better for this, um, for this weight class. His arms particularly look like they've gotten bigger. So maybe his power will have increased. Who knows? But at the same time, maybe he won't move like the Connor at 155. Maybe he won't have the speed and the agility of the 155 Connor. There's a lot of questions that need to be answered in this fight. Very true. Let me conclude with this. Cerrone is not a good starter. He usually takes a good two to three minutes to get going. That is when Connor is absolutely dangerous. He is a killer in those first two to three minutes. And I would say up until the middle of the second round is when we can keep the scales in Connor's favor. If it goes later than that, it starts to go towards Cerrone's favor. But I'm going to call it, I think that Connor wins by TKO at the beginning of the second round. What do you have to say, sir? Well, uh very, I don't know if I could top that very perspective analytic skills because you pretty <laughs> much figure with that. Uh, with that being said, analyzing both fighters, like you said, you got to take into consideration Connor's last fight was against Khabib uh, back in 18. Of course, we know how that ended. And, you know, he took a whole year off. He has been training. Um, from recent interviews, I watched this interview today with Ariel Hawani. And, of course, you know, Connor's had a bad reputation. But watch the interview. That could be fight hum humbled him in so many ways. Like, I'm starting to see presence of old Connor when he first came in. Like, he even said so. People want to see 15, 16 Connor, but he's like, I've matured. You could see in some ways that the Khabib fight and his life in general humbled him and they brought him back focus. And we all know, say what you want, when Connor McGregor is focused and locked into a fight, he is very dangerous. Not taking anything away from Cowboy Cerrone. Cowboy has over 40 freaking fights with Zufa Company, period. WEC, UFC. And um, like you said, he's been an active fighter. He's on a two-fight uh, losing skid. I mean, he did lose to, no, no disrespect to, to top contenders in Ferguson, who he didn't look bad in that fight as well. I feel like if the third round had ha it let it happen, who knows what the outcome could have been. Yeah, if he didn't blow his nose, you know? Yeah, um, of course, you got... KO'd against Justin Gagey in round one. So, I mean, and Cowboy has experience at 170. You know, he did lead the lightweight division. He's fought some notable people at 170, has some notable wins against some lethal people, too. Um, I, I give it, I'll give the slightest advantage to him in 170 because Cowboy is more comfortable there. Uh, with that, uh, Connor, I'm curious to see what Connor we're going to see. If we're going to, like you said, locked in and focus, Connor's going to be a problem. Um, me, I'm hoping this fight goes to distance. Reason being, Connor's been out for a whole year. I wouldn't see what tools he has. You know, has that ground game of his developed? You know, does he is he gonna pull off a submission? Who knows? You know, we, he's won his all his fights by knockout. Um, 
Oh, if it goes, this is of course, like you said, because he's Roni early on as Connor. Uh, you know, I'm gonna go with McGregor in this one, just because you know the striking advantage, like you said, uh, the power advantage. I can see that happening. I can see, if it does end quickly, I can say possibly maybe the first round TKO. Yeah, I can see a first round uh, KO as well. Um, Cerrone is a tough test. He's a tough test. Like I said, Connor would be foolish to go to the ground with him. But I, I know for a fact, and I've been watching videos of Connor roll, and there's uh, Connor's abilities on the ground are well documented. Anybody that says that Connor doesn't have a ground game hasn't been paying attention. Because, I mean, he's a brown belt. He's legit brown belt under uh, John Cavanaugh. John Cavanaugh is an excellent grappler. I would say that that is John Cavanaugh's base, actually. So John Cavanaugh has a lot to offer Connor. And Dylan Dennis, who is not allowed to <laughs> corner Connor in this fight, but he does train with Connor. And Dylan Dennis <sighs> set aside the... Um, you know, the antics of Dylan Dennis as well. Dylan Dennis has some of the best jujitsu in MMA right now. He yeah, really does. He does. He's one of the best jujitsu guys in MMA right now because his style is very modern. You know, he has a modern jujitsu style akin to Gary Tonin um, and all these big name jujitsu stars that are now starting to transition into MMA. So if Connor picks up anything from him, he's on the right track. But it's it's not his strength. We all know this. It's not his strength. His strength is striking. Um, so he needs to keep it there. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. If Connor loses this fight, I don't know what happens here on out for Connor. I don't know if he's even relevant anymore. And it's it's it pains me to say that because there's so many other fighters who have fallen farther than that mm -hmm. and come back. You know, it, this should not be a make it or break it fight for a fighter um, at this point in their career. But because it's Conor McGregor, because he has so much hype and so much controversy behind him, two losses in a row is basically a nail in the coffin. Mm -hmm. It's horrible for Conor. He, it's not like he's going to fall off the face of the map, but he will not. He just won't be as relevant anymore if he loses to Cerrone. Very true. So I kind of hope that Connor wins. And and I feel bad for saying that because Cerrone, I, I love Cerrone as a fighter, but Cerrone will be back. You know, we know Cerrone will be back, win or lose. Connor. Can't say the same. I don't know if it, I don't know what will happen for Connor. Um, I don't know if he'll go to a different promotion. I don't know if he'll go into boxing. I don't know if he'll quit MMA altogether and just focus on his whiskey business. But he's too talented to, um, to not see in the octagon again after this. I really believe that. All controversy aside, I want to see Connor fight again. And I think in order for that to happen, he needs to win this fight. So, yeah, that's kind of my thoughts on that. Uh, I might go to Buffalo Wild Wings to watch that one. If I can get off work, that'd be nice. And it should be crazy there. But, but yeah, I kind of feel people on uh, not wanting to spend the 60. I think, I think pay-per-views went up. I think they're 65 now, 65 or 70. That's crazy, man. That is crazy. It, Pay-per-views are too expensive, even for a one that I really want to see. It's uh, it's just an expensive life that we live as MMA fans. All right. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to be heading to Buffalo for that one. Know, Buffalo right? Wild Wings. For sure. All right, guys, we're going to keep this one short today because, um, you know, not as much going on in the world of combat sports. Um Quick shout out to the uh, 1FC fight, which was the only event in the past two or three weeks 
Um, what was it? Haggerty lost to Rod Tang. That was an excellent fight. If you haven't seen it, that Muay Thai fight got dropped with the body shot a couple times. Brutal. St- Stamp Fairtex won. Not sure how that fight went. I did not catch the highlights on it. Did you? Yeah, I did. She won by uh, TKO. Oh, did she? One. Yeah, in round one. Excellent. And um, what else was it that? Uh, Oh, yeah, the Ton Lee. Ton Lee used to fight for the UFC, if I'm not mistaken. And now he's in 1FC, and he is tearing it up. Uh, I think it was a first-round knockout. Um, but, yeah, 1FC doing big things. Uh, 1FC is weird. They don't really announce their fights until, like, a week before it happens. Um, yeah. And then they'll announce it, but it'll just be, like, the main event. And then they won't tell you who's on the rest of the card, which is, like, really weird. At least their website doesn't. I, I try to keep up to date on their website. I'm always trying to check to see who's fighting on what card. And, yeah, they don't let you know till last second. Drives I'll, me nuts. I'll check the, the Instagram quicker than usual. But a title fight was announced at 1FC. He oh, yeah? also be fighting for the flyweight title against, uh, I forget who's the flyweight champion in 1FC. But um, Mighty Mouse will be fighting him in April for the title. I think it's... Uh, no, that's the Bantamweight guy. Oh, I'm not. I'm not sure who the flyweight I, title is. I, I think his name is Andre Marias. He just came back to me. Oh yeah, he's a skinny little guy. Yeah, that should be good. I'm pulling for Mighty Mouse, man. Yeah, like they, like we talked about, because uh, when you asked me the purpose of the the Grand Prix, basically, one for the viewers who don't know, when one championship has their Grand Prix, who are wins the Grand Prix, set up title shot. So Mighty. Uh, Grand Prix, so he's fighting for the title, the official title next. Um, as far as the lightweight one, I don't know because remember, Christian Lee had to step in for injured Eddie Alvarez, and Christian Lee is the lightweight champion, so he pretty much won his own tournament. <laughs> yeah, he won his number one can title spot or title contender spot, I should say, which is basically what the Grand Prix is, I guess. But yeah, that's awesome. So yeah, uh, keep an eye out for that for sure. Um, Legacy or LFA, LFA. Uh, that's the one uh, that's going to be on on Friday, if I'm yeah. not mistaken, if you have UFC Fight Pass. And that's a pretty good regional promotion. So uh, I missed the last one. I'll definitely be checking out that one on Fight Pass. Get me ready for the weekend of fights. And uh, yeah, that's all I got. You got anything, my friend? Uh, no, nothing pretty much. It's going to be exciting. Oh, yeah. What thing? Um, I don't know if you saw the news. How do you feel about Edison Barbosa moving down to featherweight? Edson Barbosa to featherweight. How the hell is he going to make featherweight? Yeah, Jesus he, Christ. Yeah, he's moving down to featherweight. These guys are crazy, man. They're going to have some kidney failure or some shit. Um, how do I feel about it? I feel like he's going to murder people if he can make the weight. I feel like he's can kick anybody's leg at featherweight and just break it in half. That is going to be a scary featherweight. I mean, I get it. Uh, he's kind of had his ups and downs in his career and he's looking for a fresh start maybe. So I get it, but also Edson is big at 150 or 155 rather. I don't know how the hell he's going to make that weight. but if Jose could do it, so can, uh, Edson. That's true. But Jose went from 45 to 35, but you know what I'm saying? Mm Mm-hmm. But yeah, um, to anybody that listens to us on, um, you know, whatever podcast hosting website you listen to us on, whether it be Podbean or Spotify or iTunes or whatever, our last episode, it uploaded to Anchor. So what? I, so for those that don't know, I uploaded to Anchor.fm and then Anchor.fm does a really great job at distributing it to every single podcast hosting website out there. That way I don't have to go and do each one manually really convenient the last episode i posted it made it onto anchor.fm so if you wanted to listen to us on anchor you could but for some reason it did not distribute to the other hosting websites like podbean and all that so i there may have been some people that missed it um so if you missed the last one and want to catch up you can go on anchor.fm to watch it or uh listen to it rather And I'm going to try to make sure that this episode gets up to all the other websites. Um, I hope it does. hope it doesn't give me any problems. But um, 
obviously it will be up on YouTube as it always is. And, you know, it'll be on anchor.fm. So check us out there. And, um, yeah, if you are looking for some rash guards, I uh, got some soluble rash guards that I personally use all the time. Uh, the one that I got, I got like two soluble rash guards like three years ago, and they're still in like perfect condition. I use them like three or four times a week. And yeah, they haven't failed me yet, which is more than I can say for some other rash guards that have ripped like on the first week of use. So definitely repping some Sonable right now. Go check that out. Got the link in the description. Um, and I think that's it for us this week. We will be up and running again, um, let's say, by the end of next week. And then yeah. next week we'll have another episode because we'll want to recap the uh, the whole card again and all that had transpired by then. So, yeah. All right, guys. Thanks for watching again. And take care. All right. Take care, guys.